March uh, something or other. Okay, but we're not doing anything different than we know. Smile. <laughs> you turned it on? Yeah. What's that? We, we, if you say something really, really amazing, we'll focus in on you. Um, okay. So, you convinced me last time that we should continue our discussion of Renaissance drama. And I was trying to actually justify that since there's so much other material that's so important during our period. How can we justify doing another play, a play by Shakespeare, especially when you're going to be taking a course on Shakespeare? It really doesn't make that much sense, right? So there were two reasons that I decided to go ahead with it. The first reason is really that we, we've been telling a particular story about the Renaissance, and that story has gone through um, people like Wyatt, where we talked about kind of masculine interiority, um, to people like Spencer, who are emphasizing the importance of individual interpretation, process of interpretation. And we're anticipating getting up to Shakespeare's, uh, to Milton's Paradise Lost, in which Satan plays a central role. And in certain ways, that's the, that's the epitome or the apotheosis of the individual, Milton Satan. So I was thinking really that there are many Shakespearean characters who are part of the story. Richard II is one from his history plays. Um, Hamlet, the obvious one. When you get to read Hamlet, you really understand the extent to which, hopefully when you read Hamlet, everything that we'll be doing in this class will help you make sense of that play much more. That that play, again, kind of reaches the heights of interiority, of self-reflection. Hamlet is, to make it simple, Hamlet is the birth of the meta, right? It starts with Hamlet in, in Denmark and Elsinore. I mean, he's the super self-conscious character. But also part of that story, and I think I mentioned this last time, uh, I mentioned the critic Harold Bloom. He says that, um, Bloom is a, a famous American critic. Um, he says that Rosalind of As You Like It is Hamlet's functional cousin, meaning Hamlet is a kind of dysfunctional figure. And Rosalind, the way I understand that is he represents a certain kind. He, she represents, at the same time, the psychic complexity of Hamlet, or at least part of it, but also well-being, psychic integration, which of course Hamlet doesn't, isn't able to do. It's kind of interesting, the plays were written at about the same time. Um, so Rosalind is a kind of feminine version of the individual, and we'll also see her, we'll also see her exercising her agency of commanding the scene in ways which will make sense in the story that we're telling that leads up to, to Milton's Satan. But more of that later. Um, my favorite line from the, from the play is, the truest poetry is the most feigned. It's on the board. The truest poetry is the most feigned. What would that mean? I mean, it, it seems on the surface, I think, to be contradictory to us, right? It's not so All right. But what does feigning mean? Pretending. So this is one of the characters in Shakespeare's play. And you could say, well, it's just a throwaway, and it's related to this character. But as I mentioned last time, and you should definitely keep this in mind when you're studying with Dr. Shupak, I'm sure she'll, she'll, she'll emphasize this as well, that Shakespeare is so incredible because every scene, no matter how irrelevant you think it is, provides a kind of window into the play. Shakespeare plays are very, very long, right? So directors naturally cut parts of them. The one of the exceptions is Kenneth Brownell's Hamlet, which is like four hours long, and because Brownell said, I'm not cutting any of it. It's a movie made in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes directors will, will cut the scenes that we as close readers of Shakespeare will say, why did, well, why did you cut that? That was like, in, in terms of the narrative, it may have had no significance. But in terms of understanding the play, it's kind of crucial for us. Um, 
So on the one hand, it's a line that maybe we just have dismissed, but we're not going to. The truest poetry is the most famous, so it's a kind of, as you said, oxymoron. Mm -hmm. um, Fading means counterfeit or artificial. So yeah, how could that yeah, possibly yeah. be true? <coughs> Anybody? He's saying that within the lie you see truth, or, but that lies have truth in them. Remember, I mean, we are especially, uh, we're especially equipped to answer this question. Remember, Sidney says the poet never affirmeth anything, and therefore the poet never lieth. Right. Remember, right? He wants to get rid of that whole truth criteria. So there's some, you know what, I, I've, I've always kind of read this play um, as a defense of, as Shakespeare's defense of poetry. Yeah. Um, it's funny because there was a 2006 movie that Kenneth Branagh, he directs a lot of Shakespeare movies, also directed. Um, they advertise it as Shakespeare's light is comedy. <laughs> and in a way it is Shakespeare's light is comedy, but it's also Shakespeare's deepest comedy. Which is, and that's what makes Shakespeare totally different than any other dramatist who ever worked. That he's able to do both at the same time. That he's able for it to be both light, and it really is light, and you walk out of the theater and you're euphoric. You'll see when we finish watching the play. You'll, you're just, you can't help be part of it. Of, of the celebration. Remember we saw the end of the Marlowe play and there was drumming and music at the end, especially of comedies that are, would always be music at the end. And it's almost as if Shakespeare pulls us out onto the stage. And there really is something, I'm gonna use a strange word here, there's something magical about As You Like It. And I can say that because, remember Rosalind says, my uncle is a magician, right? And just like, so remember we were talking about black magic and white magic? Right. For Marlowe, um, obviously, the black magician. In Spencer, there are these two kinds of magicians, the good magician, the bad magician. So when Rosalind says, oh, I have an uncle who's a magician, Shakespeare's talking about that good kind of magic. And that good kind of magic, that good kind of, um, for Rosalind, magic is her means, on some level, of controlling exactly. everything around her. And Ro Rosalind really becomes, at the end of the play, she really is the stage director. And she tells everybody, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Um, good, so, so the truest poetry is the most feigning. Also may be suggesting to us that Shakespeare is interested in questions of art and artifice and the way those things may overlap with magic, but we'll get there. Um, one of the characters in the play, Jacques, do you remember him, Jacques? Jacques, well, how would you describe him? I don't know if he's always drunk. <laughs> Ilan, are you going to say? Uh, I just I remember the, the character. Is he, is, he, is he good company or bad company? He's good company. He's fun to have around. He's fun to have around. I would have thought you would say that about Touchstone. Touchstone, of course, is the fool. Oh, he's right? hilarious. Um, well, he's really annoying to be around, you know? Well, okay, I'm, I, let's not go too far with that. I'm just wondering about, about Jacques. Okay. What kind of character is he? I'm surprised that you said he's that. He's like Steph a cynical hipster. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's very good. So Jacques is a cynical hipster. Yeah. That's very good. The, you know, there was the 2006 movie, which I cannot find anywhere, has Kevin Klein in it, who plays Jacques. And he gives that speech, which is just fantastic. Um, anyway, what's interesting about the play, which we can say from the very beginning, is that Jacques almost has as many lines as Rosalind, which means that he almost takes over the play, right? And Jacques is the best line. Well, well, uh, well, we'll see. I think Rosalind has the best lines, but Jacques represents a certain kind of melancholy sensibility. Hipster works for me fine, right? He's this <laughs> melancholy guy. And his vision, as we'll talk about, is entirely different from the vision of the play. Yeah. Jacques says, Motley is the only wear that he wants to. Um, at some point he says, I wish I had a Motley coat. First of all, what is, what is Motley? Um, Motley is like a movie, right? 
Right. So I think I think the motley coat was often associated with the fool. And Jacques says, "I wish I had a motley coat. I, w I wish I yeah, could. I wish I could put on mm. those that clothing that the fool wears. Yeah. A fool. Remember, he says, a fool, a fool. Yeah. I met a, I met a fool in the forest. He's psyched up, right? Mm. Um, so Jacques then, he, he, the most melancholy character." says that he wants to embrace whatever kind of sensibility or worldview is associated with motley wear. Why would you want to be, why would you want to be associated with the fool? Because then everything you do can't be taken seriously. Right, and mm -hmm. you don't need to take the world seriously. Uh -huh. So let's, that, those are certainly, certainly true. I mean, I'm thinking though, let, let's, we'll go, come back to that question. But let's just think of the shape of the play, and we'll have the opportunity to also just go through the basics of the play, which is always kind of hard to manage. So where do we start out? In uh, the front court. Uh, in right. the court. No, in the house. Uh, in the we're, we're talking in general, the general environs okay. is the French court. Right. Upper class, yeah. And where does the play move to? Mm -hmm. To the forest. He moves into the forest, and then what happens? Back to court. So it's got an A, B, a structure. Have we seen that structure any place before? Yeah, Tercerino. It's, uh, I'm not, we're not talking about the. <laughs> very, uh, we're not talking on a local level. Where have we seen that structure uh, dominate a work as a whole? Have we seen anything like that before? Was it Faustus? Pardon? Tragedy? Faustus? Well, I'm not a, I, really, I'm talking about that geographical movement the, the from theory. one place to a different place, and then you travel all the way back to that other place. Mm -hmm. Do you want to buy a vowel? Can I, I mean, the, the Odyssey. That's what I said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we're, no, the Odyssey, the Odyssey, as we said, strangely enough, since we said everything is in Homer, the, the Odyssey, the Iliad is in some sense the structure, provides the structure of tragedy in some sense, and the Odyssey provides the structure, especially of a certain kind of comedy, this kind of Shakespearean comedy. And this Shakespearean comedy, and many of Shakespeare's early to mid comedies have exactly the structure. They start in one place, they go to a different place, and they come back to that other place which is transformed. Remember we used that narrative, tick, tock, yeah. right? And the, and, and the return to the court is the court is not the same when you get back to it as it was when you left. Okay. Why not? You escaped to nature and we're changing. Uh, okay, well, something happened in the forest. And it, it's not exactly nature, right? This is not Wordsworth's nature. Okay. It's a, I think at a certain point in the play, um, Rosalind turns to Orlando, or whoever Rosalind is pretending to be turns to Orlando and says, come woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday mood and like enough to consent. I'm in a holiday mood and I'm, I, chances are I'm gonna say yes, right? So that word holiday recurs in As You Like It and also in Shakespeare's comedies, these comedies with this ABA structure. And going to the forest can be usefully understood. It's helpful for us as readers. Going to the forest is going on holiday. Shakespeare uses this language himself, I'm pretty sure. Um, in other of his plays, we'll see, we'll see. But certainly, um, in Rosalind speaks about this holiday mood, which for her only can happen in the forest of Arden, right? And it involves, it involves something more than going back to nature. What, what, does, what I'm suggesting now is, is holiday is not just for Shakespeare this idea of going to Club Med or getting away, Holiday actually does something. And it's bracketed by the court. The court is the beginning, the court is the end. And there's some kind of, there's the transformative power of holiday. Why would holiday be transformative? It's, it's an escape to, I guess, a form of simplicity that reveals. It, like, it sounds like you need a vacation. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, so the forest of Arden is like Club Med, Club Med for Shakespearean characters. Like what? Oh God! Um, do they still do they still even do they still even have that Club Med? Yeah, they surely they do, right? Yeah. What's Club Med? You, 
Uh, you know, I don't know, Google it, right? You're, you're you know, computer literate. ComMed is like you, you go away and you give all your money and you get little trinkets in exchange and you make believe you're a primitive on a desert island and oh, you just cool. indulge yourself all that day long. Um, for some, many people like the idea, right? Um, it's a real, I mean, I, I, I said it uh, in response to Zahaba because it's a real getaway, right? <coughs> No. You guys are still Googling Club Meta. Yeah. <laughs> um, holiday is not merely just a getaway. Because, I mean, uh, tell the truth, when you went on your Club Med vacation to Acapulco, I'm sure all of you did, right? right. All you did was zombie out and lay on the beach, right? right? So that's, that's not what Shakespearean holiday is. There's something about Shakespearean holiday which is actually transformative. It's so. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of a, a, a good way of, 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 of formulating the question. Meaning, what, what do we, what, how, can, how is it that holiday can be transformative? Here's this line from George Meredith from the 19th century. I think comedy is the only way to keep sane in the drawing room. And maybe there's a parallel between what Meredith is calling here comedy and going into the forest of Arden. Why do people have to leave the court to go to the forest of Arden? Why do the people at the beginning of the play oh, because they're have to go into the forest of Arden? I guess I, I keep on promising we're gonna do the, the, the basic background of the play and the main characters. Let's take a pause and do that right they're now. Exactly. Shall we do that? Wait. Well, let's, we have to find out who that they are. So who are, the, who are the main characters that we meet at the beginning of the play? Orlando. 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 So we meet Orlando and Oliver. His brother. Okay, who else do we meet? We meet Rosalind. Rosalind and Celia. Through their... And there's... Oh, wait. And then there's the Dukes. There's Frederick Sr. No, there's Duke Sr. and Duke Frederick. Right. All these doubles, right? Duke Sr. is also Orlando. Well, Orlando will have a double. We'll have to think about who that is. But we do meet Orlando. We met, we said we mentioned Orlando, but you're thinking about Orlando and his, con and his confrontation with Charles the Wrestler, right? You have, you have Charles, Adam, uh, Okay, wait, 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 wait. I don't want just to drama his persona, right? So we have Adam who starts the play. Notice in the, in the production that we, I showed you the goal that's cut out, which is interesting. Um, um, so there's Adam who is seems to have been in some role with Oliver and Orlando. Then we go to the forest and there's a different cast of characters there. Right. Well, who goes with who goes with Rosalind into the forest of Arden? Celia and Touchstone. So Celia goes and Touchstone goes as well. Touchstone is a natural in the forest of Arden. It's interesting at the end he stays. He doesn't leave. Because in a way, ready for this? Touchstone as a character represents the spirit of holiday in the court. The fool, all, the fool in Shakespeare always will represent the outsider's perspective, the holiday perspective, inside of the court. I think Rosalind says something at the beginning of this play that the normal role of fools is to make sure that the people who consider themselves wise at court don't act foolishly. Mm. That they provide a perspective that's not available. So Touchdown naturally goes to the forest, and he's one of the marriages at the end, right? Um, so let's go back to those doubles, those pairs. Duke Senior, Duke Frederick. What happens to them? They're broken off, right? One exiles the other. Orlando, Oliver. What happens? Oliver is the older brother. Oliver is the older brother, and Oliver says to Orlando, to Orlando more than once in different kinds of ways, be not a while, be nothing, right? So it's a way of, we see in, in the beginning of this play, on the level of the masculine at least, not the feminine, there's this split. Orlando Oliver, Duke Senior, Duke Frederick, there's this exile and this break. And, and, and what, are the, what, are, what, is the, what are the attitudes of those who exiled their counterparts. What is Duke Senior like as a Duke? What is Oliver like as a brother? 
Tyrant. Extremely paranoid. Right. I mean, so they're extremely paranoid. They're they're tyrants. Tell me more though. What about them? They're cruel. They're not well liked. Uh huh. Right. So they and, and thought, remember that. I thought Duke Senior was the one that was dead. Yeah, Duke. Duke. Duke Frederick. Duke right. Frederick. Right. So Duke Frederick. Thank you. Take So Duke Frederick. We see that he exercises a kind of rule which tolerates no difference whatsoever. If there, even though this is a very light comedy, it's also a deeply political play. It's about, in some sense, about po different kinds of political arrangements. So we're meeting, our, the, 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 the court is not a very happy place at the beginning of the play. Each one, again, each one of these brothers, and they're both brothers, is trying to deny the existence of the other. And, make sure I'm getting this right, Senior eventually will exile Rosalind. Why yeah. does she do that? Why does he do that? Frederick. All right, sorry, the bad one. Frederick, in the end, in the middle, in beginning the middle, of the play, yeah. exiles Rosalind. Oh, because why does she? Why does he do that? Because her father was technically uh, a traitor, and she well, has this whole speech about how it's she, not hereditary. Right. But it's really because he doesn't like how she's more popular than his daughter. Right. right. And she says, and he says to his daughter, what's Everyone, his daughter's name? Celia. 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 Everyone yeah. likes her more than you. Basically that. Yeah. And so by she, comparison, you're not good, so you have to get rid of you also. And Oliver basically says the same thing in relationship to Orlando. He says, I don't know why I hate him, but right. I can't stand him. But I can't stand him. And he says again and again, or he says, he tries to just nullify the existence of Orlando. And we should mention, that though there is the split at the level of the masculine, feminine is different, right? Or Celia and Rosalind stick together. Right. In some sense, that relationship is the most interesting relationship in the play. And, it, and, and unfortunately for Celia, it has to get betrayed at the end. Their relationship must be betrayed. Why? What do comedies end in? Comedies end in marriage, marriage um, right? So yeah. <laughs> that re that relationship between Celia and Rosalind, is, we know from the beginning, is not going to survive, mm -hmm. even though it seems like the best one. It can survive because this, even though, and Shakespeare, as we mentioned, is obviously playing with ideas of gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And there definitely is a suggestion that their love is of, of an intense variety. So it's like Shakespeare, right. at, at the end of... of, of as you like it, like at the end of any comedy, heterosexual marriage has to be affirmed. Because that's the nature of comedy. I read though that in comedies, there's like a quota of there has to be at least two marriages, but here we have four. I, I don't know if there's a quota, but you could say, since we're, we're talking about the structure of the play, um, so Zahaba says there are four marriages at the end of the play. Isn't that pouring it on a little bit thick? Why do we need four marriages? I think touch. I think somebody says touch them. There are so many couples. It's like animals going into Noah's Ark, <laughs> right? So why does Shakespeare have to give us those four marriages? We're happy with one. That's that's the generic contract, right? That's why Rosalind and Celia can't end up together. Again. The generic contract is I'm going to end in marriage. Richard Gere, Julia Roberts, they're getting married at the end. But I, there's no formula for two either. But, but Shakespeare, I mean, your comment just points out the way that four, like, why do we need four? Why is that necessary? So there might be some sense, and, and, and um, Touchstone's comment about Noah's Ark is emphasizing that. And we'll, we'll have to frame this differently later on. Is that by having four marriages at the end, Shakespeare's basically saying to his audience, are you happy now? <laughs> Remember what what what's the name of this play? As you like it. As, as you like it. Like Are you happy? Do you like what you see? It's like so Shakespeare's like saying, I'm gonna you you want all of the pleasures of comedy. I just gave them to you. It's like right? everybody gets they, married. They enjoy them. Everybody gets married. But there's also that I mean, but there's also that sense that Shakespeare says this is where it's a little bit more subtle. It's like he's hitting the nail a little bit too hard. Like, and not unintentionally. Yeah, it's to show the irony. 
What do you mean by showing the irony? It's not, like, it's not showing irony, but it's ironic. He does it in the sense of I'm mm. giving you what you want, mm. but I'm going to overdo it to show you how ridiculous you are. Well, okay, you're, now you went a little further. I mean, I think he's simultaneously fulfilling the generic contract, mm -hmm. but he's, well, also, show, but he's also showing, <laughs> I, know, I know I'm doing this. I know this is... What you want. And what's oh, wait, 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 wait. I know this is artifice. I know this is a play, right? He's proving that he's aware. Meaning, part of that is, I know reality is really not like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> this, the generic contract of comedy allows us to live in a certain kind of world. And he kind of, he emphasizes that absurdity by having Hyman come down and marry all the four couples. Can, oh, can we just wait? I, I'm, I, we haven't even gotten up to scene one, uh, act one, scene one, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Um, so where were we? In many, many different places. Where were we? Uh, ending in four marriages. That's like over at the end. Right. Yeah. So really that's the generic so contract that Shakespeare is meeting. He's setting up for us and also meeting for us. Um, in, in fulfilling the generic contract. That this is in fact a comedy. But we, we're back to the question, why is comedy the thing to keep you sane in the, in the drawing room? Now we're talking because particularly about this kind of comedy with that holiday in the middle of it. It's because everything is so serious that it, it's all somber, ah. so if you don't even have that uh, comic relief, then you're gonna go insane. Do you know, do you know, do you know any lead? <laughs> Here's a pop, pop news quiz. Do you know any international leaders who have no sense whatsoever of irony? And you're not answering yeah. fast enough. Yeah. The President of the United States, right? Um, do, do you want people without irony to be your spiritual leader, your family leader? Do you want your parents to be without irony? Irony is the biggest gift I've given to my children, right? The ability to hear it and also meet it out. You have to be careful what you teach your children. <laughs> um, um, would you want a parent without irony? No. I mean, irony. What does irony allow you to do? Um, diffuse tension. Uh, okay. Well, uh, let's. Go uh, beyond the stereotype. Break the truth. <laughs> break. I mean, what do you mean by? I mean, I like the metaphor. Um, what do you mean, break the ice? Uh, or more connection. I just think I was thinking of break the ice is like like seeing it from a I, irony allows you to see things from more than more than one perspective. That's what irony depends upon. And if you don't if you don't have a sense of irony, it means you really can't see the perspective of other people. Kind of seeing like your own truths and kind of other people's truths, kind of seeing beyond the cliches a little bit. Just, what, what's the metaphor? Oh no, what? there was being no what? metaphor. I was just saying about seeing beyond cliches. There oh, beyond any... cliches. Okay. Um, so I think if, if the world of the court represents kind of cl the cliche of a certain kind of political power that is unmovable, that can't see any other perspective than its own, what does Duke, which is the bad one, what does Duke Frederick, Frederick do to Duke Senior? Yes, because he can't deal with more than one perspective. What does Oliver do to Orlando? Vanish. Vanish. Can't deal with more than perspective. Celia and Rosalind, right? So you see, in some sense, the ideal of uh, the ideal relationship at the beginning of the play is the feminine one because they can they can accommodate each other's difference. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. So here's you know that movie, but that book by Cheryl Strayed. Um, um, what was that called? Wild. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. With who was it, who started who started her as her in the movie? Oh, she's from Big Little Lies. Reese, um, we, Reese, Reese Weatherspoon, Weatherspoon right? Yeah. What am I talking about? So Cheryl Strayed wrote a book called Wild. She had a very horrible divorce. Horrible things happened to her in her life, and she decided, in order to straighten herself out, she went, was going to take a hike. So her hike was not three miles, you know, around uh, the city limits. Her hike was the Pacific Coast Highway, oh. which is like how long? Long. Yeah. Like, oh, like fifth, the I think it's more than that. I think it's over a thousand miles. Somebody can Google this, right? It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's in like an impossible thing to do. Uh, so the book is excellent. The movie not so great. Um, 
and so she, she quotes in the book Winston Churchill Clark, whoever that is. Time in the chill, in the wilderness has a lasting, curative effect. So she's also talking about this idea of being away from the everyday that allows you to somehow transform. Meaning maybe that's the transformative power of holiday. It's getting away from the singleness of perspective of the everyday of the course and being able to see things in more than one way. Here, here's a great quotation from T.S. Eliot and he's writing about contemporaries of Shakespeare. We'll actually read some of them. He's writing especially about John Donne, who we'll read soon. Eliot writes, wit involves, probably, probably, a recognition implicit in the expression of every experience of other kinds of experience which are possible. Eliot is at his best when he's thinking like people in the 17th century. A recognition implicit in the expression of every experience of other kinds of experience which are possible. I mean, again, if you think of political leaders like Trump or whoever you don't, whoever you see as similar in this country, all they see is one perspective, only one perspective. It's a single vision. There's no possibility of another perspective. That's dangerous. So wit is this ability to see, as Eliot says, in one experience, the possibility of another. And one, from one thing, I can see the possibility of another thing. It, 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 I guess it's a training in complexity. Rosalind, I think Celia says to, to Oliver, trying to discourage him from wrestling. But don't worry. You're... If you could see yourself with your eyes, yeah. there's no way you would do this. And that's like that's almost what the play is leading to giving you perspective being able to see yourself your own self right. with your eyes giving you perspective yeah. i mean you Eliot and freud i think are interestingly related um i i just am very fond of this quotation from freud um this is from an essay called ready for this you don't have to write it down the antithetical meaning of primal words. Sounds like good vacation reading, right? The antithetical meaning, antithetical means the opposite meaning of primal words. So primal words, Freud basically makes a lot of this up. He relies on 18th century um, anthropology, but some of it will resonate with you. Primal words, says Freud, they have the, the characteristic of meaning one thing and their exact opposite. What would be an example of that? Are there any leftovers of that in English or in Hebrew? A word that means one thing and its exact opposite. Yeah, right? <laughs> good. <laughs> I, that's, that's good. But let's use another, let's use a, um, that's a very idiomatic. That's nice. How about the word to cleave? Oh, so the, so what, what's, what does the word to cleave mean? When you go to the butcher, he has a cleaver. What does he do? He separates right, things. Right. Sometimes, I think in some of the, tri the, the biblical translation, Adam cleaves to his wife. He joins her. He becomes one. It's, it's, a, it's a great example, right? What, what, what cleave means both, both things which are exactly opposite. One is to unify. One is to separate. So Freud wants to say something about language, but what he's really saying is something about experience. Man is not able to acquire any conceptions otherwise than in contrast with their opposite. That ideas come into the world in relationship to their opposite. Definition by opposition? When I say I really don't want to go to the movies with you tonight. No, I, no when I say I, I really, really want to go to the movies with you tonight, but, no. I, I, what am I, I'm already responding to the part of me in my soul and my psyche which is saying, I do not want to go to the movie with you tonight, right? right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a simple example. But so Freud's notion here is that experience is always, always informed by its opposite. And the court before the forest of Arden has no room for the possibility of oppositions. Is and, and that maybe, and so we were going back to Eliot, right? 
seeing things from more than one perspective. Being able to see that, I mean, Freud is saying, the nature of reality is such that you can only see it fully through oppositions. It's even going further. That's the nature of the world. Here's an example from quantum physics. Am I a quantum physicist? No. Did I pass 12th grade physics? I did well in 12th grade physics. Am I qualified to talk to you about quantum physics? Probably not. No. But there is a very interesting experiment. You want, you want to get the class done? <laughs> so, I mean, you could. No, um, I um, So I was going to say shorter. Oh. But there is the, the um, oh, there is Niels Bohr. Uh, uh, Tegan wants to talk about Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, and I have to confess that always, always confuses uh, me. Oh yeah. But let's not go there. Yeah, when, in your free time, because we could go there and go down a very long path. You don't want to do that. Do Google Schrodinger's cat. Yes. Remember in Breaking Bad, what he takes on the name. Oh, wrong, wrong name. This video, this video is not working out well, is it? <laughs> anyway, so the Niels Bohr's theory of complementarity, which I think I remember well enough to, to represent somewhat accurately, is that if you look at an electron, these small things in molecules, Same, I don't know, yeah. right? So you want to know both their position <laughs> and their velocity. Okay. You want to know where they are and how fast they're moving. And it's impossible, actually, to determine both at the same time. You need one experiment to see one thing, and another experiment to see another thing. Also, is, is light a wave or a particle? Is light a wave? Or a particle. Yeah, isn't it? Te yeah, it's so you'll see that scientists, de it depends how you measure it. Well, when light from light one light perspective, light. it's a wave. From another perspective of measurement, it's a particle. The, the cool thing is it's never both at the same time. Uh, so that's kind of, why do I bring that up? Because it's like the 17th century version of T.S. Eliot. In every, of the 20th, 20th century scientific version of T.S. Eliot. In every perspective, there really is the possibility of another perspective. And in order to know the whole truth about the world, I need more than one perspective. And that's what's lacking at the beginning of the play. There, there is this uh, article in yeah. was it, was it Science Daily uh, about the double slit experiment that technically okay. objective reality does not exist. So it's interesting you uh, you bring that up. Uh, okay, the, well, you know, we, I always. Oh no, I was applying it to. I, I always promise you that one day we'll get talk. We never talk enough about really principles or theories of interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Which we we kind of sometimes hit up against it. Um, I think the terms objective and subjective are not at all useful. No, not at all useful ever for anybody. Oh yeah, no, that was. Uh, no, no, I'm article. just saying that I'm really I'm, I'm adding to what you're saying mm -hmm. that even scientists will use certain kind of experimental frameworks to see certain things. In order to see something, you have to be in a certain place to see it. So even for scientists, there is the importance of the presence of the person perceiving it and how she is perceiving it. In literary interpretation, right, the, the kind of silly conversations the people who don't do what we do have about interpretation are, is interpretation subjective or objective? And that dichotomy is, is not a very useful one. Because there are always, there is something out there. But there are different ways of understanding what is out there. That's, and that's what Bohr is proving. I can only understand what's out there with a certain perspective. Eliot, let's go back to Eliot and back to Shakespeare. For Eliot, I can only see certain things from certain perspectives. Shakespeare said, what is holiday? It's a release from the stringency of the everyday. And once I go into holiday, I have the possibility of seeing myself from another perspective. Um, 
let's, since we talk so much about the play, let's watch the beginning of the play. And you can see in this production how much the, uh, the director is from the outset announcing to the audience, this is also about politics. I'm gonna have to interrupt this about 3,000 times. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about, about the, shape of, uh, the shape of comedy and different, ver and the shape of comedy is dependent upon different versions of time. I think it's Jacques who says, from hour to hour, we write and write. That's comedy, right? And from hour to hour, we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. Jacques is like the counterweight to comedy, right? So you have both of those visions. One is the vision of tragedy, and the other is a melancholy, and the other is the vision of comedy. Rosalind says, why talk we of fathers when there is such a man as Orlando? Why talk we about the past when we can talk about the future? Comedy is about the possibility of the future. What, again, why does, why does comedy end in marriage? Because there is so much possibility in marriage. marriage because marriage, 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 marriage to a certain extent represents futurity. Are there are there any are there any tragic elements? I mean, I always forget which painting I'm looking for. What a death of potion I remembered. Um, I just love this painting. Oh, nice picture also, right? Um, let's see. Are there are there any aspects? I don't know if you read enough of it yet. I thought you read the first two acts. Yeah. When you go to the pastoral environment in As You Like It, when you go to Arden, what kind of place is it? It's a pastoral place. It's, 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 it's unsettled. Okay. Well, we, it, well, so we've talked, so right. So we talked about yeah. holiday as a mental space, but as a physical space. When we meet the Duke there, are they playing, you know? They're singing. They're singing. There, there's a lot of singing in As You Like It. Also like Are they animals. frolicking? <laughs> Not necessarily, they're just having a good time. There's less of a... Uh -huh. well, well, I mean, they're, fr they're freezing. Oh. And Shakespeare emphasizes that. And they're also like, there's never, we read Johnson's to Penshurst, and in Johnson's to Penshurst is total abundance. And that goes with the whole pastoral right. genre. Yeah. What happens in this, like... Everyone's always... Starving. Everybody's starving. Yeah. Everybody's starving, right? right? Adam almost dies, right? Everyone right? Dies. And they kill a deer, a venison, and they dw and, and it's dwelled on. It's dwelt upon. Right. So I, it's important, right? What happens when somebody dies in a Shakespeare play? What happens generically? Um, tragedy. As soon as somebody dies, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Yeah. I'm sure you all remember Romeo and Juliet from high school, right? Right. And the, the generic signals in that play, which you'll read, the, the dramatist, Shakespeare keeps on sending the gen generic signal. Comedy, 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 comedy. There's a mask, there's the kinds of things you see in comedy. And then in the middle of act two, Mercutio, one of the characters, gets killed. What happens? Tra it's tragedy. So interesting that Shakespeare, in his best, in his in middle comedies, in his best comedies, there's always the possibility of death. Look at this picture by Poussin, the French artist who is, who is painting this pastoral landscape. Right? What's, describe this pastoral landscape that you see here. Okay, okay. You can't really see it, can, we, can you just give us the light? No? Countryside, isn't it? It's, so we, uh, we have, oh, perfect. We haven't really, we haven't really defined, oh, okay. oh this is nice, right? Nice. Wow. Isn't it gorgeous? Oh, that's gorgeous. I once saw a show at the Museum of Someplace, I guess. The <laughs> no, and they had there's a huge paintings, and he painted a lot of them. Oh, so you see them together, and they're just unbelievably Are gorgeous. So f first of all, we noticed all the pastoral elements, and we saw pastoral in Ben Jonson. We saw the the inverse of it in in Amelia Lanier, um, but Johnson is our ideal of it. This idea of total abundance, and we do get that here. 
and the sense of lushness and the shepherds and the sheep. But the what's in the foreground? Yeah. This, this is uh, this painting is called The Death of Phocian. I don't know who he is. It's a dead body. But yeah. we, e body. even in this image of and pastoral utopia. completeness and utopia, exactly, yeah. you have this image of death. It's and in a sense, one of the one of the amazing things about Shakespeare in comedy is he goes always very close to that. Right? He's got you've he got he, meaning which makes it which makes it not only generically more complicated, but it makes it some, it makes it emotionally more complicated because it's not it, we we know there's a we know there's an underside here. Marriage gets affirmed, but death is present. Right, there are stakes. Yeah, good. Would you get the lights back on? Yeah. So here, let's watch this as the beginning of the play. Um, can, can we can we do? Should we put the lights off? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. For people watching at home, um, yeah, so watch about five minutes of this now. Right, I mean, also, we didn't even mention Oliver almost kills oh, that, that uh, Orlando. Actor. Right, Charles almost killed him. Oh, before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see the explicit politics of it here, right? This is not, Shakespeare doesn't write any of the Latin stuff. We see the beginning of the play starts with the investiture of political power. We find out what's behind that, right? Well, yeah. director here is really dramatizing it and the way we've been talking about it, the split between on the one side Celia mm. and the other side uh, 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 Rosalind. We're the only ones wearing color, does that mean anything? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, well, they're the it's light of the Pretty show. gorgeous, right? Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's just so beautifully composed, right? Right, this is not in the play, right? Play starts with Adam. That was very fast, wasn't it? Let's go back yeah, here. They, yeah. they, so they skip. They switch. They they skip the whole scene with Adam, and in any other context. And, and I will tell you, in this case also, that the first scenes of Shakespeare's plays are all extremely significant. Maybe we'll go back and look at, at Adam's scene, which really leads into this conflict with Orlando and Oliver. Who did we just see come on stage? Orlando. So that's Orlando, right? Yeah. I think so. I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion, bequeathed me by will but for a thousand crowns, and, as thou sayest, charged my brother on his blessing to breathe me well. And there begins my sadness. My brother, Jack, he keeps at school, and report speaks goldenly of his profit. For my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or, to speak more properly, stays me here at home unkept. To call you that keeping for a gentleman of my birth that differs not from the stalling of an ox, I, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, for the which his animals on his dunghills are as much bound to him as I. Besides, this nothing that he so plentifully gives me. 
For something that nature gave me, his countenance seems to take from me. He lets me be with his hands, bars me in the place of a brother, and as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam McCree, and the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. The spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny. How does his brother keep him? Like like an animal, like an right? Animal. Yeah. yeah. And here it's interesting that that Orlando is saying the spirit of my father, and in a way it's already preparing the way in which this comedy is going to resolve generationally, right? This I'm no longer an animal. The spirit of my father is in me, and I'm also going to become a man, a father. I mean, I know I'm reading, I'm pushing this a, a little bit, but I'm just saying the part of the generic contract that Shakespeare is making with us that this is a comedy is already established from the very, very beginning. This idea that Adam now, or Orlando now, is claiming his heritage. He no longer wants to be nothing or a mere animal. We'll see if, we'll see if that argument keep, uh, is it, we, if we can sustain that. I will no longer endure it, though yet. I never know why the husband You under come to my master, your brother. Go apart, Adam, thou shalt hear how he make you here? Nothing. I am not taught to make anything. What ma you then, sir? You, notice, you notice the repetition of the word nothing? Right? Yeah. And that Orlando wants, uh, Oliver wants Orlando to become nothing. I'm helping you to ma that which God made, a poor, unworthy brother of yours <coughs> with idleness. Well, Marius will be better employed. And be naught a while. I... Again, what does or, what is or, Oliver say to Orlando? Be not a while. Be nothing. Keep your hogs and eat husks with them who you where you are, sir. Oh, sir, very well. Know you before whom, sir? I, oh, better than him I am before those men. I know you are my eldest brother. In the gentle condition of blood, you should so know me. I have as much of my father in me as you. <laughs> that seems quite physical, right? Yeah. <laughs> Look at these kids, right? Yeah. Make, making their day, right? take this hand from thy throat, the director has given as a cue to have this entire scene, right? Yeah. Just we should be aware, and I know Dr. Schupach will emphasize this as well, that this is a representation of the Shakespearean text. And every time we see a production, we have to be aware of the way in which the director is kind of pushing our direct, pushing our, our focus. Does this work for you? Do you like this? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting also, it's like at the beginning of the play, and there are a lot of these people there, and they're standing up and they're like, what am I doing here, right? So it's a way of just bring a very kind of Elizabethan or Shakespearean way of just bringing the audience in. My tongue for saying so. Hey, bastard, be patient for your father's remembrance. My father charged you in his will to give me good education. You have trained me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me. I think that's the third time he said it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do it I'll no longer like endure it. Therefore, <laughs> allow me such exercises as may become a gentleman. Or give me the poor lottery my father left me thy testament. With that I will go buy my fortune. But what will that do? Huh? Beg when that is spent. I will not long be troubled with you. This is not some part of your will. Get you in. Yeah, I know that it's So in even in, in this in, get you in <laughs> means that Orlando's Oliver still has the upper hand here. 
Um, so he has all the money. He has the power. Right? He has the power, yeah. Um, and, and, or, and, I'll, and Orlando has to kind of sneak away. Let's just see where we are right now. Um, what's the whole deal with Charles the Wrestler? Um, he's hired by Oliver to ac accidentally kill uh, Orlando while they wrestle. Uh -huh. So this guy comes in, Monsieur Lebeau, and um, actually they ask him what's the news in the court, and he said there is no. And he says there is no news but the old news, which doesn't surprise us, knowing what we know about Frederick's court, right? Because there can never be anything new; everything is always the same. So Orlando arranged. Sorry, Oliver arranges with the wrestler Charles to kill his brother. And here's we and, and here's where we'll meet. We'll meet um, Rosalind and Celia. Beat him, ladies. See if you can move him. Pull him hither, Monsieur Le Beau. Well, do so. I'll knock you by. You send a challenger. The princess is called for you. I attend them with all respect and duty. Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? No, fair princess. He is the general challenger. I come, but in another suit, try with him the strength of my youth. Young gentleman. Which one, which is which? Rosalind the blue. Rosalind's the tall one. <laughs> and it gets emphasized again and again. Yeah. And your face did you both feel oh, here? Yeah. You seem full proof of this man's strength. If you saw yourself with your eyes or knew yourself with your judgment, the fear of your adventure would counsel you to a more peaceful enterprise. We pray you for your own sake. She's saying to him, You're gonna lose. be sensible. Yeah. But, but Orlando's a bit of a romantic, right? Yeah. Um, when, when he goes out to the forest of Arden and he's um, in love with his Rosalind, he writes, he, 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 writes, he writes poems and hangs them up in, in trees. Apparently, it's really practical. It, it, right. so, so many of Shakespeare's um, masculine heroes and comedies are bad poets until they're transformed by, by, their, by their, uh, their feminine uh, counterpart. But just like Romeo, Orlando is a bad, he really is a bad poet. And that goes along with this kind of idealism that he has. And Celia says, you're stupid, you're gonna get killed if you could see yourself with your eyes and know yourself with your mind. But Orlando, being the romantic that he is, continues on. Oopsie. Young shall not therefore be misprized. We will make him our suit to the Duke that the wrestling might not go forward. I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts, wherein I confess me much guilty to deny so fair and excellent Lady Penelope. But let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial, wherein, if I be foiled, there is but one shame that was never gracious. If killed, but one dead that is willing to be so. I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world, no injury, for in it I have nothing. So he really is he's nothing, a, he's right? Yeah. And nothing, as you'll find out in Shakespeare, and when you study Shakespeare, is one of the great Shakespearean words. Only in the world I fill up a place which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. The little strength that I have, I would it were with you. Am I? Can you help her? Fare you well. Big guy, right? Come! Where is this young gallant that is so desirous to lie with his mother earth? Ready, sir. You shall try but one fall. Now, Hercules, be thy speed, young man. I would I were invisible to test the strong fellow by the leg. You mean to <laughs> mock me, Arthur? You should not mock me before. Wait, who's the guy in the red over there? Oh, the that's the touchstone. Yeah.
Cha-cha. You saw the fool in the background hamming it up. No. Shakespeare, you, Shakespeare had problems with the fools during his era because they wanted to steal the show. <laughs> Much, we'll see much more of it. How dost thou, Charles? Cannot speak, my lord. Bear him away. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my liege, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. I would thou hadst been son to someone else. The world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still mine enemy. Thou shouldst have better pleased me with this deed hadst thou descended from another house. I guess it's well, another, you... another rival to the duke, right? right. Mm. Well, <laughs> thou art a gallant youth. I would thou hadst told me of another father. Would I, my father? Let's just pause here and we'll move a little bit forward. This to, that we'll move a little forward to see. <laughs> Uh, maybe we should watch a little bit of that interchange. We sure, really surely we should, yeah. Okay, here we go. Father Cut, when I do this, I am more proud to be Sir Roland's son, his youngest son, and would not change that calling to be adopted heir to Frederick. My father loves it. It's interesting that Orlando says, I would not change my fate to be adopted heir to Frederick. Who else is kind of considered to be adopted heir to Frederick? Rosalind. Rosalind, he, she, uh, Celia says as much yeah. that you're just, or when when she's about to, when they're about to go to the forest together, or there's a question that Rosalind may by go, go by herself. I think Celia yeah, says, I can't, live without you. I can't live without you, but wait till my father dies, and then I'll give you his inheritance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So both Rosalind and Orlando are thought of in this kind of similar sense, right? Yeah. Um, of inheriting something. And being cheated out of it. Roland is his soul, and all the world was of my father's mind. Had I before known this young man his son, I should have given him tears unto entreaties that he should thus have ventured. Gentle cousin, let us go thank him and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me at heart. Sir, you have well deserved if you do keep your promises in love, but justly as you've exceeded all promises, <laughs> your mistress shall be happy. Gentlemen. That was pretty suggestive, right? <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the overlap or the similarity between love and wrestling? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's for me. One out of suits with fortune that could give more, but the time. <laughs> 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 how, old, how, they're, they're, how old do you want them to be? Shall we go, come? I fare you well, fair gentlemen. Can I not say I thank you? My better parts are all thrown down. That which here stands up is but a quintain. My better parts are all thrown down. What's the relationship between love and wrestling? Right. <laughs> a mere lifeless block. My pride, wealth, and my fortune, we are asking what you would. Did you call, sir? <laughs> <laughs> you have wrestled well and overthrown. <laughs> I mean, there it's really explicit. You have wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemy. You see, this production is really much, much better than Marlowe. I mean, they're, they're, it's really good, right? Well, Catherine, <laughs> why does these weights upon my tongue? I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference of poor Orlando. Thou art overthrown, or Charles, or something weaker, masters than Peter. So he's going to find out he's banished. Let's skip ahead. I, I think I, th I think we, we're we're learning now that um, <coughs> that well we'll see that they decide to leave together right there. Whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers? I will give you mine. <laughs> <laughs> I charge thee, be not thou more grieved than I am. So even now 
that line, it's funny, but it's also consistent with what we've been talking about, right? right? I'll give you mine. Oh, that's not cousin. Let's look at the way they're dressed. She's a little bit of a daughter. I'm here to laugh, though. I'm not. Rosalind Baxter and the language teacheth thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be certain? Shall we part? We don't know. <laughs> Why did the director do that? It's, it's, it's to still show the power that he has, even after I, the I, I, It just shows the way the political intervenes in the personal. Mm -hmm. Let my father seek another heir. This will divide with me how we may fly. Let the girl and what to bear with us. Do not seek to take this change upon you. To bear your griefs yourself and leave me out. For by this heaven, now, as a sorrow's pale, say what thou canst. I'll go along with thee. But why? Whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Yes. Let's go to Disney World. <laughs> 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 Wait, wait, what, did, what, have they, what have they decided to do now? Themselves themselves themselves. Themselves. So they're going to the forest of Arden and they're describing the, 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 um, <clears throat> disguising themselves. Who's going as what? Celia is going as a poor maiden and Rosalind is going to go as a man. One second. So Celia is going as a poor maiden. What's her name going to be? Alina. Aliana. Aliana. And Rosalind decides that she's going to name herself after Ganon. Right. right, but that's a slight problem. I mean, not. I mean, she's going to be dressing up as a boy. A boy. Mm -hmm. So we've already pointed out the way in which Shakespeare is playing with gender distinctions. Right. Also, oh, and to be sure, we can emphasize this or understand it more, given the reality of the Elizabethan theater. That is an all-boy theater. So you have a boy. Dressing up as a girl, as a girl dressing as a who's boy. dressing up uh, as a boy. And remember, part of the plot of the play is another play within the play. Careful. Part of, part, part of the, the play is that um, Rosalind will dress up, sorry, that the Ganymede to set up a play with Orlando pretend to be will pretend to be a girl. I didn't Rosalind. get it. Pardon? I didn't get it. Get it. A boy, okay. he's the actor. He dresses up as Rosalind. Rosalind goes into the forest, dresses up as a boy. Then in order to try to convince Orlando that he's not in love with Rosalind, Ganymede pretends that she is Rosalind. Oscar Wilde said, give a person a mask and they will tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Like Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, Several different changes to pretend to be themselves. Well, I mean, that could be seen in, 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 in holiday in general. When you put on a mask, you can find out who you are. The truest art is the most thing, right? When you act in a false way, somehow you can be closest to the truth. So they dress up together, Rosalind and Ganymede, and they go off to the forest of Arden with Touchstone. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just as we'll, 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 we'll start to finish here, but just as kind of a prelude to the, our next class, um, we mentioned that the forest of Arden that they arrive at is not a place of abundance. That even as Shakespeare is adopting this generic form, oh, by the way, Shakespeare stole this play from somebody else. There was an original play called Rosalind, so Shakespeare stole it. Would he be, would he be penalized from, by Bar-Ilan uh, plagiarism policy? No. Uh, no. Um, Nobody because cares. the two play, the amazing thing about Shakespeare's adaptations is that though they are exactly alike, they're 
couldn't be more different somehow. I mean, Shakespeare adopts lots and lots from Rosalind, but somehow he's entirely transformed it. In the source play, it is this generic pastoral place of abundance. So Shakespeare changes that. So there is kind of um, a sense of loss. Corin, this country bumpkin who they meet up with, he also talks about his master being cruel and him not having the kinds of advantages that we would normally associate with a pastoral, with a pastoral figure. Yeah, I, I saw a production in New York years ago. Who's the guy who directs the um, James Bond movies? Uh, no idea what he's um, he's a big He's a big director. Anyway, he directed a version of As You Like It, and the second act opened. So in the second act, you're in the Forest of Arden. What might you expect? Sorry. All green. Yeah. If for him, and he was kind of making the point that I'm making to you, it was a completely bleak and empty place. If you've seen a play by Samuel Beckett, that's what it was like, a completely empty environment. By act three or four or five, I forget when, the whole place, Sam Mendes, the whole place becomes green, right? But it's interesting that Shakespeare will do that. Well, maybe we'll start with that question next time, why it is that Shakespeare does that. Um, we also have to consider what this play is about. What is this play about? 